Hello, 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 and welcome. I'm Miriam Kalili, and we are DM25, a radical political movement for Europe. And this is our regular live coordinating call. Today is March the 8th, that's International Women's Day, where we celebrate the achievements of women across history and across the world. But let's also use this occasion to look at how much work remains to bridge the gender equality gap and ensure equal rights and opportunities for all. I read a stat that said that um, at the current rate of progress, it will take 108 years to reach gender parity worldwide, particularly in the areas of economic and political empowerment. And also that there are only six countries, Luxembourg, Denmark, Belgium, and a couple of others that give women equal legal work rights as men. What's going on here? Let's sort it out with our panel from DM25's Coordinating Collective, the board of our movement. First, we'll hear from Juliana Zita, who's the leader of our party in Germany, NERA 25. Then we'll open the floor to hear some personal stories across the panel. Um, and then we'll ask our panel what issues they think DM25 should be campaigning on that could make the most difference in the short term to close the gender gap. You out there, you. If you've got anything you want to say, any thoughts, rants, ideas, comments, concerns, questions, please put them in the YouTube chat and we will put them to our panel. And if you like this, please do subscribe. There are 100,000 of you subscribing so far and we're honoured for the interest. Okay, let's kick it off. Juliana. Yes, thank you, Mehran, um, for the introduction. And first of all, um, happy International Women's Day to all women and um, everyone who's fighting the fight with us <laughs> um, all along. And uh, yeah, I think you've opened very well, Mehran, because indeed um, that was also a question that I asked myself while writing an article that we published uh, today. You can, if you're interested, read it on our website. Um, I, I asked myself, like, what, what, what is with feminism and what is the development of, uh, of women's equality during my lifetime alone because this is where I think everyone can have a full perception of what happened during their lifetime and I have to admit that uh, I failed to find the big steps forward I think there were little fights that were fought and won but I think in terms of um, of how it's going with with equality um, I think the number that you just said is just shocking but I think it also shows uh, in the results we see worldwide, because female make 50% of world population, but very, very few of us are, for example, in positions of power. And I think one vice president here and, and just a representative there won't make the difference in the end. And I'm not going to get into the quality then of those representatives, to be honest, because this is another topic, but I think it's, it's really not enough. And um, so, we have to think about what is the way forward to, to the liberation of females, but also of all other groups that share just the same struggles as, as, as we do for centuries. And um, I think what is mostly important to me is to measure also the development uh, by looking at the quality of life that women have worldwide. And it's, it's really shocking to say, but the quality of life for women is decreasing day by day at the current moment with every war that's uh, that's taking place with the crisis we see in with the invasion we see in Ukraine, for example, women are fleeing, women have to take care of the children alone, they have to leave their partners behind. They are looking into an uncertain future, uh, coming into countries where they don't know people, they don't speak the language. It's something that my own mother went through, by the way. So big hugs to her. I think she's my first role model when it comes to feminism. And just knowing that out of the position as a child, I know that how much anxiety these women go through, not knowing whether you can stay in the country or whether you have to leave and go back. Um, you just don't know what's going to happen to you and your children. Um, also something I want to point out because it's, it's also very urgent is that we see in the example of, of Ukraine that human trafficker are going to the borders and making ex promises to, to females for shelter in another country, you know. It's a really, really dangerous situation for, for women in many countries, especially those with, with huge crisis. But 
we can also not turn away from the fact that all these crises we have worldwide are intertwined with each other and that it's it won't be just about what every single one of us can do at this moment because we are running out of time in so many crises that we have when it comes to global warming when it comes to uh, saving lives before wars escalate further um, I think time is so urgent and this is why I made the bold, bold title for, for my article that I think feminists should unite because I believe that feminism, what we all have in common, at least what I think when I think about my friends, be it female or male, who call themselves feminists, is that, is that we come from a, pe a position of compassion. And I think what, what, what we all want is to build a world and a system built on cooperation and solidarity. And for me, the opposite of it is the system that we have currently, which is a system built on competition and profit. And I think it's also the basic reason why you don't find so many women in these structures. It's just because you will find them more in jobs which are social, where they can make something good for somebody else. So until the political and the structures we have in society and in workplaces don't provide as an outcome to do something better, I don't believe that you will find many more women participating in that. Hence, for me, the conclusion is that we have to rethink our ambitions and our goals as feminists and to say it's not just about having better rights within this system, but it's also about questioning whether we should build a new system and advocate for that, like we are doing with the Green New Deal and so on. So. Yes, this is so far my opening statement, and back to you, Mehra. Thanks very much, Juliana. Okay, let's hear from Maya Pelovic from Serbia. Maya. Ah, well, I don't know where to start. Um, first, uh, happy 8th March. Uh, and uh, yes, it is International Women's Day, but um, I think it's a very, very sad 8th March. Uh, and um, usually if I was, I, I'm now in Montenegro, but if, if I was in Belgrade, I would be walking with uh, my uh, uh, fellow uh, friends. Uh, we have an 8th March, um, 8th March March uh, in Belgrade. And uh, it is never a, a Women's Day March, if I could say, uh, because for me, uh, this uh, um, struggle against uh, patriarchy, as I would call it, uh, is always a struggle against capitalism and is always a socialist struggle. Uh, so whenever we do it in Belgrade, um, either if it's Women's Day or if it's uh, the Gay Pride, uh, we always uh, go together with uh, workers, uh, with uh, unemployed, with the precariat, uh, with the Romas, uh, and uh, we always go with other vulnerable uh, uh, groups of society that feel uh, like the others in a way. Uh, and um, in that way, I, I really feel very emotional in these days uh, because of the uh, war in Ukraine, uh, as uh, I have in, in my life witnessed two wars. One, one was the war in Bosnia and uh, the other one is the NATO invasion and the bombing of Belgrade. And I have to say that um, when we talk about any kind of women's struggles, we have to talk about the struggle uh, uh, for the others, uh, for the most, uh, the ones that will suffer most with this war. Uh, and that's why I will not uh, talk about personal story of uh, me being in a way uh, oppressed as a woman, because I think at this point I'm a very privileged uh, uh, white uh, middle class woman sitting in a non war zone. Uh, I want to talk about uh, all the people uh, and all the, uh, the vulnerable uh, uh, people that will be uh, struck by this uh, terrible war that is happening. Um, of course, the, the first ones that will be struck uh, are, of course, the women and children that are now crossing the borders and uh, going into completely unknown territories. Uh, together with them, uh, also, uh, we witnessed uh, a lot of racism on, on the borders. So we uh, also see uh, a lot of people that, because of the color of their skin, uh, are uh, not able to cross the borders. Uh, 
because they are not, as some Western medias call them, uh, uh, blonde with blue eyes. Uh, also, um, I'm very, very, uh, uh, in a way, uh, I have a very big problem uh, with the way the West uh, uh, dealt with the, the refugee crisis when these people that were crossing the borders uh, had a different color of skin. So this racism we have to talk about. We also have to talk about the class struggle. We have to talk about people that do not have the money to go from Ukraine, because I know a lot of families. Uh, I'm here in Montenegro and I'm in contact with a lot of Ukrainian families that are not able to, uh, because of money issues, to, to uh, cross the borders. <laughs> Uh, we also have to talk about uh, uh, the ones that will stay, uh, the males, because I think that patriarchy is also hitting the males that are staying in the country in Ukraine and that uh, are in the Western media being perceived as brave people, uh, brave fighters, uh, Ukrainian fighters. And some of these brave, brave people actually do not want to be brave at all and do not want to kill other people, but want to uh, also flee the country and they cannot do it because the borders are closed for males to, to leave the country. Uh, so I think that at this point, uh, talking about women, we should talk about all of these others. We should also talk about uh, uh, the, some of the Russian people uh, that uh, are also being uh, in a way struck by this war. Uh, some of my uh, Russian friends, uh, artists that are being banned uh, uh, to participate in activities because they're Russians. Uh, I, as a Serb, uh, have been, um, um, had these kinds of problems uh, being um, uh, after the, the war uh, called uh, fascist. And like my, my grandfather was actually uh, one of the founders of the partisan movement here in Montenegro. And uh, he was in a, in a camp in, uh, in Italy. And it happened to me on the Venice Biennale that they were um, expecting to, for me to be uh, in some kind of way. And I had this uh, Milosevic uh, uh, person uh, uh, thing on, on my back for, for a long time. So I think also the Russian people, uh, the ones that are against the war and that are against Putin will have their own struggle after this war ends uh, when it ends. Uh, so I think that uh, this uh, dividing of the world, uh, this uh, Cold War rhetorics that we're witnessing, uh, that is happening, uh, and this, uh, again, dividing about, uh, of the uh, East and West, uh, uh, a satanization of a nation at one, uh, at one side, and at, uh, at the other side, of course, this uh, terrible war uh, in a country that uh, uh, cannot fight back. And uh, I think that uh, these are terrible times, and we should at this time think of the others and after the war is over uh think of uh also the others that will uh continue to suffer uh after this war ends that will be what i wanted to say thank you Maya. well said uh julia julia moore from the uk hello good evening everybody thanks miran uh, happy international day everybody um uh, a couple of thoughts uh on this day uh, a couple of books i thought i'd mention uh, that have influenced me through the uh, the decades that I've uh, lived through, which have been interesting decades of change in terms of uh, sex discrimination with the introduction of legislation. I'm talking about UK specifically here, and obviously with the EU influence of legislation as well. Um, but for those of you who have um, who have not already familiar with the book, the first text I talk about is the uh, standard reference text for feminism and the attitudes of patriarchy and structural changes, Kate, uh, Kate Mill, it's sexual politics. And for anybody that hasn't, isn't familiar with that, um, a very good read, an uncomfortable read, but the it stands the test of time because if you read it uh, through different decades, um, it becomes different things. You, you can see the reference points of where things have changed and where things repeat through structure and history. Um, so I would certainly recommend that. As I say, it's not an easy read, it's not a comfortable read, but it is one of the reference texts and that, and that is, uh, is a great read. Coming a bit more up to date, uh, I think many, many uh, people are familiar with the text called Invisible Women. And the strapline title for that is Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. And it is um, a fantastic case-by-case -case study of the designed world that we all live in 
um, but where uh, women and vulnerable groups are systematically discriminated against and have their lives made more difficult than they need to be from everything from um, the, the Finnish case study, everything from pavements which are designed uh, for incorrect widths for women or anybody pushing prams, which have now become uh, equipment for uh, disabled people who are using pavements, etc. And that sort of civil engineering that's not keeping up with the with the test of time, but but proportionally affecting uh, women who are walking. We know about lighting, keeping women safe and keeping everybody safe. And at what point? does the case that's brought about by women um, occupying physical public spaces becomes a safety issue for all and how that narrative needs to be looked at. But one of the biggest chapters that I think you're most interested in Invisible Women is the way that medical technology uh, tests drugs disproportionately on women and therefore women don't get uh, equal treatment within medical sectors, etc. It's a fantastic textbook. So just two uh, examples that I've extrapolated for that. So uh, for those of you who want to do a little bit of reference reading to understand repeated structural failure, vulnerability, how vulnerability is repeated, etc. Certainly those two books I'd recommend. Um, and I think we're going to come back in the discussion about where we think DM25 ought to go in terms of uh, what we do as a progressive organisation. Uh, and maybe I'll come back with that, but I would say always confidence building uh, in terms of female education. We know that where education is improved, then females' uh, health improve, and that indirectly and directly finds its way into economic improvement. We're not going to talk about growth because that in itself is a new economic topic that we need to discuss, but certainly improvement criteria and quality indicators and life chances are improved when young women are remain longer in an education environment, and that's true in, in developed in Western economies, it's true in developing nations, um, and it is one of the universal truths. And maybe as a progressive organization, that's where we put our energies. I think that's it for now for me, Miran. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And yes, we'll be returning to those issues of what DM25 should be campaigning on. And you out there listening to us, if uh, you've got um, thoughts in the chat about what could be the most pressing issue to tackle with regard to gender equality, then please. Uh, please mention them in the chat and, and they'll feed into our discussion. Ivana Nenadovic from Serbia. Hi, thank you and um, happy Women's Day to everybody. Um, as Maya said, uh, as I am from Serbia, uh, but I was born in Yugoslavia and my upbringing was in this socialist uh, environment, um, equality of genders was a given. And uh, for me, growing up uh, from the perspective of a child, it was uh, quite simple. On the 7th of March, we would make presents for our mothers. It was handcrafted and write little notes. And basically, we would praise our mothers for being our heroes. And uh, when you look at it, uh, it is part of the patriarchy. And as a child, you grow up uh, and you adopt this, that mother should be the pillar of the house. She goes to work, she cooks, she cleans, she takes care of uh, the children and her husband and so on. <clears throat> and that, that kind uh, forms you, right? But uh, of course, the patriarchy in Serbia is strong in the family. But uh, in the system, or at least uh, it appeared to be so, it was equal. And uh, only when I got uh, involved with the DMMR, I um, came across these uh, quotas and some discussions that I never came across before, especially because my background is in the theater. And in theater, there, are no, there is no this, uh, burden of quotas and gender equality because literature, literature is not uh, equal. There are more male roles than female roles uh, to begin with. <clears throat> but it's uh, the theater, I want, what I'm trying to say is the theater is much more loose environment. So these uh, re rules and restrictions don't apply. Patriarchy, of course, creeps uh, on, on you. 
but what I think, uh, if, if we are talking about uh, also what DiEM as a movement should do is to show how the politics, which is normally restricted for uh, men, could be also um, inviting environment for, for women as well. And I guess that this uh, panel also proves that. Uh, I would say that it's a matter of difference of energies, feminine and masculine, and they need both need to exist. It's just a matter of uh, the balance. And um, something that I would like to, to try to emphasize is that uh, empathy and uh, emotions, which are all usually connected with uh, women, are in politics not welcome because politics are supposed to be this strict and professional and emotionless business. Um, so when we see women in politics, we see them being basically worse than, than men uh, because the point is not to take the power out of the hands of men and uh, put it in the hands of women. Uh, it, it's about... Uh, this destructuring this power. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. Some very important points made there. Um, who is up next? Dushan. Dushan Pajevic from Montenegro. Yes, I couldn't agree more with Ivan. I have to highlight that. And uh, as I always joke, uh, we need to get rid I, I'm not joking with this part. I will come to the joke. Uh, we need to get rid of uh, identity politics for purpose of seeing Angela Merkel or Margaret Thatcher as woman, you know? And then I always say, uh, I am much more of a woman than them. So it's not about being, what is, what are your organs? Because even on the biology side, but let me not start with the gender theory because that's my field. It's not uh, that clear. So I will start, start narrowly and then expand towards the wider context i will start with my own personal story so i've been working with for some time now lgbtq organizations trans organizations and i did my master's in psychology of intercultural relations where i did my thesis on sexism among other things and um, I've held many lectures on ecofeminism, on total liberation theory, on trans rights and similar. Now to come to the point, uh, I'm also a gender non-binary man from Montenegro. So I suffered greatly under this system because it was expected from me to behave in certain ways and to replicate certain patterns uh, that I don't want. So I want to show sadness and other negative emotions that are not just anger, which is the only negative uh, emotion allowed for men to, to show. I don't want to act as a promiscuity person and to have multiple girlfriends or whatever. I don't want to eat meat or to always act tough because all of these things are strictly male gender roles. So I want to emphasize how we all suffer greatly under these power dynamics. Women, trans and non-binary people and men. Yes, you heard me correctly, men. Because to indoctrinate boys into the rules of patriarchy, we force them to feel pain and to deny those feelings. So we need to acknowledge that men fight wars end up in prisons disproportionately, show less emotions and commit more suicide. This is not because they are inherently evil or there's something naturally wrong with them or because feminists oppress them or some other conspiracy crazy uh, theory. It's because of the patriarchy. So I'm not men's rights activist as they call them, I'm a feminist. I'm a feminist for gender equality and I'm feminist for the 99%. It's not black and white. 
men are not uh, just aggressors towards women. Uh, we need to make conscious that patriarchy affects us all and that all of us are sexist towards the femininity in a more or less degree. So femininity in ourselves and in the others. Uh, the sexist system is aggressors towards this uh, since femininity is intervened in all of us. Uh, Finally, we need to highlight the role, not just women, but also, sorry, not just men, but also women play in perpetuating and sustaining patriarchal culture so that we will recognize patriarchy as a system women and men support equally, even if men receive more rewards from that system. Dismantling and changing patriarchal culture is work that men and women must do together for the 99% of us. And uh, before some of you attack me in the comments for being men or whatever and talking about women role, let me say that this is a quote uh, by Bell Hooks, uh, black woman author. Uh, so let's finally work all together towards dismantling this identity politics and dismantling patriarchy at the same time. Thanks. Thank you, Dushan, and please be gentle with Dushan in the comments. Um, you did, you did Maya from Berlin. Um, yeah, so I was going to talk about um, the tradition of um, Mother's Day. I remember this from uh, when I was uh, small that um, we too uh, were supposed to create uh, little gifts uh, for, for our mothers uh, in kindergarten and at school. And uh, my mother uh, was very adamant about not wanting any of these um, because uh, for her, um, Mother's Day was asso uh, associated uh, with the Nazis, because here in Germany, I mean, of course, Mother's Day comes from a, from a fe feminist in the US, and then in, in Germany it was pri uh, primarily the, the flower shops that were promoting it at first, but then um, the big breakthrough for Mother's Day uh, was uh, when Hitler arrived in power, uh, and he really wanted to encourage women to be mothers uh, foremost, um, so he turned Mother's Day into a bank holiday. Uh, it is no longer a bank holiday that was abolished uh, after the war, except in Berlin. Um, and uh, then on this day, he gave out like awards, like, uh, like an iron cross, except for mothers, um, a bronze cross for those that had four children, uh, a silver cross for those that had uh, six children, and uh, a gold cross for those that had eight children or more. And uh, this is just such a, a, a vulgar, disgusting uh, practice that uh, my mother did not want anything to do with that. And I always had to destroy any gifts that they made us uh, create in class and be sure not to come home with them. Um, but uh, for all of uh, this um, supposed tradition of um, uh, honoring uh, mothers and, uh, and women, uh, Germany is still failing at the basics. We still have a lot uh, of uh, femicides. Um, and also, uh, when it comes to uh, sexual violence, it's uh, still a, a very common, uh, current topic. Uh, some years ago, when there was this big wave of uh, refugees coming from uh, Syria, um, some people tried to make it look like uh, the problem of uh, sexual violence against German women is mainly coming from Syrian or other Arab uh, men. And that was a complete lie uh, because we, we see the problem now with uh, so many Ukrainians, mainly women, uh, coming into the country. And uh, here in Berlin, the, the volunteers had to stop um, matching any women with a private host because there were so many cases uh, of uh, abuse uh, of men expecting sexual favors in exchange uh, for hosting uh, refugee women. And these are German men, right, uh, here in Berlin. So um, it's, it's really a huge uh, problem. And I think that uh, this is something that urgently needs to be tackled. Thank you. You did a couple of uh, comments here from the chat. This one's for Maya, I think. I love that you brought up that men also suffer from patriarchy too. True, it's not something that you often hear. Um, I believe the only way to help reduce the discrimination against women is a global basic income for women from birth to death with no limits. And something for Dushan. Uh, most of what this nice man is saying was said long ago by second wave feminism. 
But the way trans rights activists treat us women today is shameful, so aggressive and sexist. So that's a uh, part of that uh, part of that debate which is going on um, between trans rights and women's rights. Um, who is next? Beral, Beral Madra from Turkey. Thank you, Mehran. Uh, yes, we always celebrated this day with joy, but today it was a little bit sad, you know, we didn't have that joy because of this war going on in Ukraine. We were anxious, actually. I think since my childhood, after uh, Second World War, I have witnessed uh, several local wars in the region and since many years, ongoing tragedies of migrations in and out of Turkey, in which always women suffered more than all the other people. And, uh, you know, there are countless human rights and freedom of expression violations. And I, I'm really sad to say that there is a merciless femicide issue in Turkey. Several thousand women are killed by their uh, husbands, brothers, or father, even fathers. Uh, I will not mention the religious sex, child abuse, and pedophilia, etc. Uh, one of the last tragedies was uh, Serebrenica uh, massacre. I had the honor of making the exhibition of Andrei Darkovich about Serebrenica victims, and I was embraced by Serebrenica mothers. It was a very, very uh, important moment for me. I think I have seen enough for a lifetime uh, in this uh, European and Middle East uh, region. It seems it is still not enough. Now we see Ukraine women suffering. But I must now also mention my Russian friends who are also suffering. Uh, and uh, I remember that after the collapse of the Soviet world, many Ukrainian, Russian, and Moldavian women had to come to Turkey to work in domestic uh, jobs. So we, we have seen their, uh, their uh, tragedy uh, because of the economic collapse in their countries. But what gives me hope and strength is the resistance of women, and in particular, contemporary women artists. Uh, in all their multidisciplinary works, uh, a clear and unbiased vision towards democratic transformation, a, a freedom of expression and communication, respect to pluralism, human and gender rights issues, responsibility on ecological problems, development of public awareness are in their works. So, so we should look to their works and get from these works an inspiration. Today, uh, in many cities of Turkey, there were uh, large crowds uh, the, the, uh, opposing to the all the uh, uh, problems in Turkey, and they were uh, also very colorful uh, scenes uh, with local uh, local uh, uh, local women who uh, came with their beautiful uh, local uh, fashion. And, uh, but in Istanbul, uh, the police has interfered to the meetings, uh, but the women did not stop. I have the hope that there is an uh, enormous awareness uh, about uh, women's equality and position in uh, Turkey. So I think uh, the women will, uh, have the victory at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Burrell. 
Let's bring back Dushan Pajevic. He'd like to respond to his detractors. Now, just a quick comment, basically, that we have to be aware of certain cultural differences when we talk about women's rights as well. For example, we in Montenegro face something that's unimaginable for many of the people on this call, which is selective abortions. Uh, people, when they reveal a gender of the fetus in their belly, if it's a woman, uh, they abort her. Uh, that happens, it is estimated around 1,000 times per year in Montenegro. Uh, so when we talk about uh, feminism and when we talk about women's rights, we have to acknowledge that it's much more than rhetoric, it's much more than narrative, it's much more than who pays the drink or whatever. It's literally about lives and about whether someone is born or not. And in just four months in Montenegro, we had three femicides. So killing of a woman that were killed only for being woman, which is a lot, a lot, a lot for a country with more than six, with just a bit more than 600,000 citizens. So this is my cultural perspective that I wanted to bring in uh, for us to see how many different layers and levels of this uh, system there are. Thank you, Dushan, for your nuanced response. Maya Pavlovich. Thank you, Dushan, for this, because you just reminded me, uh, my friend actually did a campaign on this uh, issue that I think also that people cannot believe that is happening in the 21st century. And uh, she did a campaign called uh, Unwanted. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, I think uh, because we're talking a lot about class issues also, uh, while talking on all of these issues. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an interesting point. While she was doing this, uh, uh, this uh, pr project, she was actually, she actually found out that most of the women uh, that uh, decided to do these abortions of uh, uh, female babies were uh, um, uh, actually women from the upper, uh, upper middle, middle class with a lot of money because at that point they had to go to other countries to do the very expensive test that costs about 800 euros. Uh, to see if the baby is male. And that is, Dushan, precisely what you were talking about when you were saying that it is the question of patriarchy is also sometimes in the hands of women also, because these were uh, very highly educated women that were uh, uh, giving money and doing these abortions because they wanted to ha have themselves uh, also ma male children. And this is also a mechanism of uh, patriarchy that uh, we should uh, pay attention to also. Uh, and in that sense, uh, that, that's actually uh, what I wanted to say, that we always have to uh, reflect on our own uh, um, cultural position, of course, because we all uh, come from different cultural backgrounds. And in that way, our fight against patriarchy uh, will be different, of course. Uh, but I think that uh, um, one uh, fight against patriarchy that we can say that is the same for all of us, uh, is uh, the fight against uh, the, the worst uh, thing that patriarchy brings, and that is military intervention. And I think that in all cultures, we can say that uh, uh, fighting against any kind of military uh, interventions and uh, in a way banning any kind of military interventions, uh, at this point, I mean uh, Putin's intervention on Ukraine, but I also think of all of the NATO uh, invasions that happened uh, uh, during uh, the, the last uh, 20 years, that one of which uh, I, I witnessed myself in my country. So that, that's the intervention that, that I would suggest. Uh, and the only one that I think at this moment uh, can be uh, in a way uh, fought in all uh, cultural backgrounds. Thank you, Maya. A couple of comments from the chat. In a system that's aimed at dividing us and pitting us against one another, the most radical activity one can undertake is to love, understand, and collaborate with others. And well, some appreciation for for some of the comments that you guys have uh, you guys have said, so uh, 
I won't bother flattering you by reading those out, but uh, good. Um, okay, why don't we move a little bit to what DM25 can actually do? What, in terms of what are the concrete areas that we could campaign on to address some of these issues that we're talking about? I mean, I really appreciate all of the, the personal stories, and I think it's, it's given a very good context to this discussion. But if there's specific ideas, um, like some of my friends who are watching in the chat, on things that you think would advance this cause in the short term, then, um, then please speak up. Eric, have you got a, a take on this? Um, I can do. Uh, I'm sure by the end of the sentence I will. So essentially what I wanted to share is a bit of a personal story with possibly like a, a way forward uh, as, a, as a sort of learning point at the end. Um, a few years ago, um, I participated in a month-long workshop in, in Poland, which was mostly populated by, you know, millennials and people from Generation Z, Zoomers, um, like myself, uh, the millennial part. And the conversation, although we were split mostly, uh, it was a 50-50 group, um, there was a dynamic that developed halfway through the, the month, whereby uh, repeatedly um, some women, especially from, from the US, would speak out um, about some of the men in the group that they were speaking too much and so on. And, and often it was the case. So this part is good, good that this happened. You could see that you know people were addressing an issue of men taking up too much space and, and so on. Uh, not maliciously, but still doing so. Um, however, what ended up being the case was a sort of environment where all men, regardless of whether they were part of the, the group that was speaking too much or not, uh, simply stopped speaking altogether because they were afraid of being seen as part of the problem. So there was this very one-sided atmosphere that developed um, where the issue wasn't addressed. It was just put under the carpet, if you like, and it was people were just suppressed into creating this kind of outward image of, of you know, women's empowerment, that women are speaking, but essentially being, being, becoming suppressed themselves. Um, and that, together with a bit the terminology that we used, the language, the, the way that the topic was addressed, all together, both the atmosphere and the way that the topic is broached, especially by the left, created a very one-sided and elitist kind of approach to the topic. And this is, of course, something that we on the left suffer from in general, this very intellectual approach to, to, to issues, which alienates huge parts of society from, from discussing it and approaching it, and regardless of whether they would agree or not with us, to, to feel part of the discussion. And when somebody doesn't feel part of the discussion, they are much more likely to, to reject it as a point of principle rather than because they actually believe so, just simply because they don't feel part of it. So what I think we need to, to, to be quite much better at than many of our cohorts and, and colleagues on the left is the way in which we discuss these things, the kind of terminology that we use to de-intellectualize the discussion around gender inequality and, and also the atmosphere to make it much more inclusive, as many people have already said today, to make it more holistic and, and a kind of societal issue more broadly that involves all of us and we can all be part of the solution, regardless of our educational level um, or our gender for that matter. That's something that I think we need to to lead the way on, because in general, there is a, there is an issue on that, in that area. Thank you, Eric. Julia, Julia Moore, let's bring you back in. Thank you. Yeah, um, pulling some of the threads together. Um, what, we're, what we're discussing here now is what a progressive movement and, and maybe with DiEM25 leading that uh, can do. And I think what is, what is not picking up um, uh, fast enough is the the bringing together of what we might call now not just men and women in order to um, forge a new direction in terms of policy making, social policy making that isn't on one power structure trying to improve 
in a in a in itself a patriarchal way the improvements for another uh, vulnerable group in society but actually um get the we would say 20 years ago we would get the two genders working together to understand their relative positions better but as dushan is saying we're now in an era of a much more complex gender, uh, sorry, identity politics. And what we're looking at is improving our physical public spaces, our economic models for the benefit of us living as human beings in that same shared space. And I think that is something that a progressive movement can build up momentum more quickly and I think we're very we've, we've been very slow to do that we we have a tendency in in discussion circles to go back onto what I would call very old-fashioned first stage feminism and uh and you know through the the various different evolutions that that and in in uh, carnations that that's taken and I really think a progressive movement ought to be doing some very very good radical thinking about um getting groups working together we are talking across a class divide here across racial divisions and navigating through that rather than still a fairly old-fashioned approach i think which just looks at the two sexes and that's why we have a repeat of power structures which then do not improve and if i can just bring a very uk specific in here actually one uk example and one international example for those of you who know anything about uk media there's been a very long-running radio show called women's hour on Radio 4. Now, it's been running since the dawn of time, and it's been a part of some ex extremely important campaigning uh, issues which have led the, in themselves to legislation. It is an incredibly important part of UK cultural history. I have always, always objected to the fact that it's been called Women's Hour because it places those issues over there in a category where it has the image of post-war women sitting down with a cup of tea at um, half past 10 in the morning, uh, being allowed their tea time to listen to women's issues. There are not women's issues. There are issues which inadvertently affect women, but are a responsibility for uh, policy makers, male, female, however people are identifying. Uh, that's a UK um, example. An international example is for anybody who here may join or anybody out there looking, uh, the Women's Institute uh, movement, which is a, now a global uh, organisation where women can join local groups and find solidarity and comradeship and uh, do arts and crafts, et cetera, et cetera. Also an organization which internationally has been very important in running campaigns, daring to put their, uh, to, to put their voices heard where uh, policymakers and governments wouldn't listen to the voices of women and by their sheer numbers have managed to get some very high profile issues in, in a very, uh, in themselves in a progressive era when nobody else was daring to talk about domestic violence for example domestic violence that affect men it's the women's institute that were bringing up the discussion about that about treating it as an issue not specifically something which affects the two gender uh, the two genders so i think we're looking at really we ought to be leading the way with a much more sophisticated um, uh, attitude and narrative uh, which incorporates the things that we've spoken tonight if we are going to improve power structures with reference to the cultural uh, relativism that Dushan and, and my other colleagues here have spoken about tonight um, and confidence building through the education systems for specifically now for women and, and young girls being confident enough to feel that they are entitled to take part in their civic lives and that they can speak freely without fear of, of, of violence or um, intimidation. There's a lot for us to do, but we can do it. Thank you very much, Julia. A quick comment from the chat from Edgardo. Uh, in Italy, it's really difficult to overcome, he's from Italy, uh, it's really difficult to overcome the patriarchy, which is still in charge, even in a softer way. Tradition and the past are still very strong, even on the female side. Amir, Amir Kiai, who hasn't spoken yet, our policy coordinator, based in The Hague. Go for it, Amir. Uh, thank you, Mehran, and uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, just a quick small update. Um, as uh, viewers and members are aware that we ran an all-member vote regarding the um, issue of nuclear energy and whether it's green or not, whether it's sustainable or not. And 75% uh, of our members voted no, that is not sustainable, that is not green. And so we're going to be proceeding with a campaign 
on the EU taxonomy regulations targeting both gas and nuclear energy. Again, as was mentioned early on and adding to Julia, tying up all the threads, is the global climate crisis is definitely disproportionate, disproportionately affecting women. And so what, this is one of our campaigns that you, we can see there's a link there to that. As well that uh, Maya mentioned the uh, war and the uh, ultimate symbolism of patriarchy, if you like, as a war industry and so forth. And we've also recently launched um, and are working on a grassroots campaign towards peace and uh, end to wars. You might have seen the hashtag no more wars, DM25 on social media. And one of the first steps people can take out there is to sign our petition, dm25.org forward slash peace. There's more coming from the grassroots campaign on this issue. Thanks. Thank you, Amir. And we're coming close to the top of the hour here. It's been a, an interesting discussion. Perhaps, Juliana, unless someone else would like to speak, perhaps Juliana would like to wrap up since she kicked it off. Juliana. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I think um, in terms of what we can do as a movement, which is, I think, a crucial part of the discussion for us, is um, connecting, connecting the way we function as DM, um, like we are connecting that with every topic. Um, it, it has to do with something that Dushan touched and Maya touched upon, that the different perceptions are really important to understand when we talk about any topic, but when it comes to feminism, I mean, um, I am kind of this, I'm living in Germany, but I know also very well the culture I'm com coming from. And I know that there are opposing sides and that there are very different perceptions on where we stand even as women. Uh, might even, some might even reject that there are places where female have not the same rights like in their area where they live. They live. So as a pan-European movement, I think, Having those different perceptions out of different countries is something that we can very well connect and we can um... up, oh, Juliana. I think your internet died. You're, are you back? I'm back. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go for it. Go on. Um, I don't know where I left off, but uh, essentially I wanted to say that um, we are a group of people that is diverse, and so I think. We have uh, a good chances to produce goals for for activists as a movement that that are inclusive, um, inclusive, including all the groups that are that could be left out to say. So I think this is something that we can provide as a diverse movement with people out of so so many different countries. Um, I think this is reflected uh, in our policies already. But, um, but it's something that we can reflect even more in our campaigns, I mean, looking forward. Um, so yeah, this is something I, little I like to, uh, like to add and um, thank you for the, this discussion, everyone. Um, couldn't agree more with, uh, with all of you. And thank, give me back to Michael. Thank you very much, Juliana. Thank you to our panel and you out there for your comments and thoughts. If you would like to join DM25 and instead of just observing, actually get working on making some of the stuff that we've been talking about a reality, then the uh, web address is dm25.org slash join. We've got grassroots campaigns. We're going to be running in elections this year. We've just founded a party in Germany. We're going to found a party in Italy. So things are happening. Things are moving at DM25. Please join us and uh, address issues like the gender gap and some of the other things we've been discussing today. That's it from us. Take care and see you at the same time, same place, 